Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome back to another Season 60 podcast. I'm Des. This is Fabian. Fabian, how's it going? Just all right, just all right. A bit sick today, but that's what life gives you sometimes. It's surely not a hangover from the major, I hope. <laughs> uh, I don't drink alcohol, so I would be very surprised <laughs> if it was. Not, not quite a hangover as an alcoholic, but more as in anything you caught from that or more as something you caught back home. No, 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 no. I, I mean, I wasn't even at the main event, right? So it, uh, yeah. it's nothing like that. True, true, fair. It really begs the kind of initial question, what have you been up to since the Major? It's uh, It feels like it's disappeared very, very quickly into the rearview mirror, but what have you been up to? Not much, honestly. <laughs> For the first time, actually having a break. Doing yeah. both EOL and uh, working in Korea, it's uh, quite heavy. Because if you think about it, I work Mondays, because we start usually around 6 a.m. Mm. I work Mondays from 6 to midnight because of practice ends, and I immediately get on the car to uh, to the studio. So it's literally six to midnight, Monday and Tuesday, mm. every week, which can be a bit rough. But I mean, it's the line of work I chose to do, right? So it's nobody <laughs> to blame but myself. Right there with you, buddy. <laughs> I guess um, when you say like the break that you guys have been having, have you been off? In, have like the team been off entirely since the major, or has there been some stuff going on? No, like you guys post up, you're looking for players, for example. Has that been keeping you busy? Yeah, I mean, we we posted a post to see what there is available. Korean scene is very shallow, and obviously there are always weaknesses that we need to improve on. So we'll see where that goes, but uh, nothing is decided yet. Awesome, cool. Well, we'll dig into that short and a lot more for those that are tuning in. And Fabian will really hate me saying this, but if you don't know who Fabian is, where the hell have you been? Uh, he is the head coach of PSG Talon, and probably, I can't say I did the count, but I went to your Wikipedia page last night, and if you look on the achievement section... They only have room for like 10 achievements and your achievements is so long that it ends in like 2020 on their bar. So it's missing like three or four years worth of results because they can't possibly fit it all into the little shorthand thing they have in the profile. But is it fair yeah. to say you're probably the winningest player of all time? I mean, when it, when it comes to it down to the numbers, yeah, I mean, the, the, there is no other competitor because I can't say the player. It, it is hard to argue on that one because I think Nick would grab that one from me since he won the... European major like online tournament, which is obviously a meme tournament, and also he won Pro League one one uh, time before we got together. Yeah. So he would be the more, most winningest player in that way. I mean, some people will say it's the BDS guys or whoever it is in terms of number one on money, mm. but then again, who gives a shit about money when you're not a world champion, right? Yeah, I completely get that. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I'll officially say the most winningest player or competitor. That we've had on the show. Competitor. Yeah, that's so how it's going to have to be. official word to go for. Cool. Um, and obviously, for those who watched the recent major, they'll know that you were coaching PSG Talon now. We've been doing that since March, I believe it is. You've been in charge there. And I think it's pretty fair to say turned around and delivered results that will have surprised everyone for a region that for many, many years now has been the meme of competitive siege. I think even when we saw the breakout of APAC into these different regions, Korea was still kind of seen as being right down there at the bottom of regions that you yeah. consider being competitive. And you've turned around a bit of a storm. And those are the kind of things that I really want to go through today. So let's talk about expectations first and foremost. I've got to ask that. Are you happy with the team's performance? And on a scale of 1 to 10, how happy are you? Where 10 is, I'm absolutely ecstatic. Couldn't have asked for better. 1 is, I'm fucking pissed off. I mean, I'll be saying that it's like a 3 at that point. Because like, okay, expectations were met 10 out of 10. We should never have gotten as far as we did in terms of preparation before right like we we know how good we can be when we want to show up but we lost to ourselves in the end like we played very good teams i mean if you think about it, we played both the teams in the grand final mm -hmm. uh and against beast coast in my eyes we should have won border but we choked the shit out of it and that's when kind of nerves hit the team you know like they've never been at this level before i mean look at the players i've got none of them have any real careers ahead of this. I mean, some players like Roy, for example, he used to be a sub for D+, plus. that's like the biggest he's done. And then Soldier obviously played with D+, plus for a year on, on loan, and now he's back with us, which I'm very happy for. Wouldn't like to have him in that team. I prefer him in mine. Uh, and then, what have JLT, Ryder, and Visa really achieved? I mean, it's not like the, those guys are household names in even the Korean League. Mm. And if they're not the household names in the Korean League, well, then we've been done something special, that's for sure. Absolutely, yeah. And this is one thing that I thought was really interesting to touch on because you've you've mentioned a point I was going to come to a bit later there. Is that I think if you look at this PSG talent squad, and this is what I think many expected coming into the major and why they expected it was, 
that maybe you'd win a game or two extra, but we wouldn't see you run as far as you did, you know, getting right towards the back yeah. end of phase two was really impressive. And a lot of the names that are on the squad are players that have, not all of them have been around for a long time, but they are, they've been around career for a while and none of them have really ever been big standout players that have shone, performed and delivered. And there's always going to be questions about, okay, are these really the right group of players to step yeah. up and deliver to a degree? And so one thing I'd really love to unpack a little bit is how the bloody hell you've managed to turn around what are essentially, in a funny way, kind of a similar story to Beast Coast. I asked Fett about this last week. You've got a bunch of players that have been dropped or whatever it might be over the last six months. You've got them together and you've turned something around that no one expected. It's kind of a similar thing for you guys, although I'm aware that a lot of the players have been on this team for a while. So what do you think has been the secret sauce coming from you to turn this band of misfits into a pretty spectacular team at this point? There are so many things that Korea has been behind on, and I think that a lot of teams really suffer from having staff that don't really know how to provide the best work environment for their players. I think that the best work environment for players is when the players have to do most of the job themselves. Some people believe that coaches should be doing everything, like they're a football coach. That doesn't really exist in esports, because I don't think that you can understand the game in the same way if you're a coach as when you're a player. And mm. I will tell you that I don't understand the game that way. I never did with G2 and I will never do it here either. But what I can give them is the guidelines on how to work during the hours that they're at work. And also, I, sure, in this, this team, I have to teach them the method too. I mean, they were really far behind. They had no idea what they're doing. But helping them take the responsibility of their own work. That is the number one priority for me. It's like they need to understand what is responsibility for them. And if they don't understand responsibility, we're going to be in a tough spot because responsibility is literally the only thing that you need to do to succeed and to continuously improve. Own your mistakes, accept that you committed mistakes and build from it. Mm. Honestly, that, that's as simple as it gets. And that's what we were so successful with the old team when I was playing that we had extreme high standards of ourselves at work. We didn't show up and go 3-9 in a practice and go like, haha, we had fun, we learned so much. Fuck that shit. We're there to win and to learn. Those are the two things in combination. And, and you need to teach everyone that, that I cannot show you and tell you everything you did wrong. You need to watch the game yourself, you need to learn yourself, and you need to think for yourself. Own your mistakes. And then when you own your mistakes, the teammates around you will trust you. And mm -hmm. therefore, you build up a bond that's stronger than anything. I mean, look at the teams that I've been part of uh, in terms of G2. How many roster changes did we do over those years? Not many. A handful, like five over five years. And why does those things happen? Well, because the trust is broken. Nothing else, really. Mm. It's because really we always had really good players. Yeah, Fett said this last week. It was about like, you know, someone asked the question, you know, when is the right time to drop an underperforming player? When do you assess it's too soon, too late, all the rest of it? And he was yeah. like, when someone's no longer hungry or no one no longer has that desire to win, to improve, to learn, that's when they gotta go. When that hunger fades, yeah. that's when it's over. Yeah. Yeah. And it really comes back to the classic saying of like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. It's the same with players. You could give them a strap book and say, Hey, follow this, it's like yeah. to increase the chance that you're going to win, but if they don't want to go beyond that and look at their own individual performance and improve it, then completely with you, yeah, yeah. it's simply not going to work. And this then begs a really interesting question because communication is the one thing that I think everyone is really curious about when it comes to you and PSG Talon. I remember you saying like one of the players speaks pretty good English, one speaks a little bit. How do you get so involved that you really kind of get them on side and help them you know, believe in your vision, your ideals, and the way that you believe they should approach the game? when half of them, if not more than half of them, don't really understand a word that you're saying. I mean, we have a translator, the Donguk, the former coach, now manager. Uh, he is uh, fluent in English. So outside of practice, he's the one translating. And then when it's actually like time to, to do something properly, um, Roy Boy speaks English as well. So he's fine. But also the boys have been putting in a shit ton of effort. Like genuinely, they have learned so much English so fast it's really 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 impressive mm. because they genuinely they have they have english lessons every week and i know that they're doing constant duolingo um every single day almost so they they are working on it or i'm fluent in korean uh, whichever version you believe in uh, is fine by me <laughs> i definitely don't believe that you're ever going to be fluent in korea i won't lie to you <laughs> it's, 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 quite no, cute. So it's, quite, it's quite cute it's got that they've got that work ethic and do you think that a lot of that is because 
of the respect for you and because they want to be able to converse more closely with you and understand you better? Do you think that's the main reason why they're so focused on learning English? I mean, the Korean culture is very strange for me as a European, right? Like mm. the, the way that they have work ethic, but it also creates a few problems because it's become some culture clashes. Uh, because what I see is that they have this absurd idea of respect that is just given. Because I'm older than them, I should just have respect because of my age. And yeah, I'm I'm old, and people say, listen to your elders and all of this stuff. But it, it, it's not like that, you know? It, it, it's I'm not always right. I've told them so many times that even if I've won everything, doesn't mean that you can't call me out on my bullshit. You need to call me out on my bullshit. If I present to you a strat or an idea that is awful, tell me. Because you are the ones on the server that have to execute it. So, so when it comes to all of this stuff on the server, like I only have 45 seconds, right, on my timeout. Mm. I've told them and I've taught them, guys, you need to figure out the solutions yourself. The only thing that I have in my 45 seconds is one big change that we can perform. But nothing more. We don't have more time, right? Mm. Have they called you out on your bullshit at all so far? No, they haven't. <laughs> Still work in progress on that front then, I guess. Yeah, um, the, you, you know how it is. The... the, the, the <laughs> That's Best still a heavy part of their uh, their culture. And I mean, are, are you surprised? Hard to be, I think. No. Against you as well. God, I'm not surprised. They're scared. Because <laughs> it, it does become hard. Even like even though you say, look, I might have won everything there is to win, but still feel free to call me out and stuff. Like They're still a bit like, ah, I best make sure I know exactly what it is I'm going to be challenging here and that I've really thought it through before I say anything, right? Alongside probably wanting to make sure they'd be able to do it in English at some stage. There's a lot of barriers for them to work through before that maybe becomes a thing, but... Maybe it changes over the next few months. We'll see, hey? Um, Something needs to change on it, that's for sure. <laughs> when it comes to tactical timeouts, this again is a big yeah. question because we all look back in history and we all remember the infamous Fabian tactical timeout, the one that really turned G2's fortunes around and got you guys to win at SI last year. You can't yeah. quite have the same style of timeouts with this team because you can shout at them. They'll be like, oh my God, that European angry man is making noise again, but I've got no idea what he's saying. <laughs> how do you have an impact during these tat timeouts? Because it has to go through translation via Roy Boy. How are you doing yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, that's just the way it is. I have to tell them what it is they need to think about when they're working and like when they're playing. And that's it. I don't have another choice. Think about this, these few things and these are the changes we need to make and then we hope for the best. I don't have enough time to do anything. I can't explain it to them properly in the in English anyways because yeah. they don't understand it. Um, so, so it's... It is just accept the situation for what it is and prepare before the game. It's it's honestly not that hard to prepare for a game. Hmm. It, it, it's what every team should be doing. And if if you get caught by surprise, well, then you fucked up in some sort of way. Do you ever feel frustrated that you can't have more impact during attack timeout? I honestly, I don't even think it's the coach's job to, to a certain extent. Like I think the coach should be preparing them for every situation because. Uh, well, it's not preparing them for every situation because they need to be prepared themselves anyways. Like I can help them. In a way, I see it as an adult babysitter where I just guide them in the right right direction. I see the in-game leader and the team captain having to have a much bigger role than what people put them out to do. And that's why you need to have the right captain and right in-game leader to do this. Because they can be easily wrong and then you will see your team fall apart or your team will start lacking. Mm. Um, so it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's you need to prepare them so that when you go into the server, the in-game leader and the captain can just take them through it. That's yeah. it. He needs to take them through it. And I can help him with my 45 seconds, but it's not enough to do any big changes anyway. I can tell him, oh, play this strat. Think about this strat. You guys missed this. But also to know those things, I would have to speak Korean because I don't know what they talk about. That's I don't what know I mean, what they're yeah. missing. I, uh, so it, yeah, I, I, I can't really help them. It, it's whatever, really. It's, to me, it's, I'm okay with it. Yeah, I but... know my situation. Everyone in the team knows my situation. Mm. And they will be just accepted for what it is. Fair enough. And we can't it... change it. And is it Roy Boy who's mainly standing as like captain because he has that ability to communicate with you? Or is someone else taking uh, no, that mantle? So, so, so it's uh, Misa that is the team captain and an in-game leader. So Got it's it. him. And he's the one that's communicating the most, at least with the team. And I mean, I don't mind saying the things that go wrong at an event. And for example, if we look at this event... Misa had issues mentally when it came to like the feeling that we needed to do more than we were. Nerves hit him. And if the game either and the team captain has nerves, that will just reflect into the body language of everybody. Everyone will understand it. Everyone will feel it. 
that's when you need to show up and just take it as a work day. And mm. that's one of the reasons why I'm disappointed with our results, because we could have done better. I think we could have beaten Face. I think we could have beaten Beast Coast. But I think we let Nurse take the better of us. Mm. And to a degree, like, do you think that's a, I guess for him, a first opportunity to be at that stage of a competition, to have made a run yeah. so deep where the pressure mounts more and more. It doesn't matter if there's no expectation on you guys and you don't care what, of course, the international community is saying because they often don't understand what's being said in that sense. <laughs> is it still kind yeah. of a, it builds up and like, you're cool, we learn from it. But then how do you sort of guarantee that doesn't become a thing again? Because, again, kind of spoke about this with FET last week. I can think back to a couple of games I've worked in previously where players have been absolutely terrible on officials. You speak to the coaches yeah. and they say during scrims, these guys are like the best players in the world, but they just can't translate it. They hit a ceiling, right? Do you worry that Mesa is going to find that ceiling and won't be able to push past it? Or do you think actually he's learned tons from Manchester and will be able to get stronger? Oh, well, they learned tons. Like, I mean, the boot, it's not so, so much the Manchester in itself. It's the boot camp before it. That's the important part. And I can tell you, they, <laughs> they learned a lot there. Um, because we got our ha asses handed to us, to be fair. Um, we did not have a good win success rate in, in the EU boot camp. And we practiced all the good teams attending the major. We practiced the UL teams and we practiced Brazilian teams. Because obviously they were also in Europe boot camping. Yeah. And that's where you learn. You learn from having your ass handed to you. I mean, take when we were playing again. We keep going back to it because it's the easiest one for me to compare to. When I was playing, we had an event. I don't even remember what event it was. But we were playing Fnatic 20 times in a row on Clubhouse Bar before Bar was even a bombsite people played. To figure out what are the triggers, how do we learn from this, and how do we activate this bombsite to be able to, to work. And uh, that's basically the team that we were. We were the bit team. We did what we were told because that's the way that the teams want to practice us. They're not going to practice us because we're these innovators of Rainbow Six Siege. They're going to practice us because they don't fear us, because they don't see us as an opponent that they should fear, and they don't see us as an opponent that we go further into the game, which is fair. I mean, we shouldn't be uh, rookie players from, honestly, the worst region in the world. So you learn. You just have to keep working. And we're okay with having that for this year. Like this year is all about learning. Generally, mm. this year is all about learning. If we end up higher than we did this next event, fine, happy with us. But take the invitational and the majors the next year after that, that's when we are looking at actually putting up a performance where people will think that, okay, maybe these these guys can make it top four. Mm. Which gonna, if the European say, team the can make it that far. I was going to say, is that the goal? These two majors this year, this calendar year, this is as well of the main real learning ones. Then when we find ourselves yeah. coming into SI in February, that's where you're saying, yeah. right now, our expectation is to be pushing top four. Yeah. Like it. Okay. I, I, I like it because it's. Uh, I think if most people heard you say six months ago, right, I'm going to go and coach BSG Talon. I'm going to make maybe one or two player changes, but I'm going to take this region, this team, to being a top four team at SI 12 months later, everyone would laugh at you and say, Fabian, you're a great guy, but you're also completely <laughs> deluded, right? It's a, it's, yeah. a, it's a bold goal. Do you share that goal with the players as well so they know what the oh, aim they know of this it. project is? I mean, yeah, I mean, that's why they're here, right? I mean, they wouldn't accept that we weren't trying to achieve that goal. Like, why would you even be part of a project if the goal is not there? Yeah. Um, it, it just has to be. And I mean, we kind of put PC talent on the map. Like, what player of a sane mind in Korea would not like to join PSG Talent at this moment. Oh, I mean, yeah. even the D-plus players and the Fear X players should be looking at us. Yeah, okay, they're having their own coach in, in, in Dark and uh, and, and uh, well, right? yeah. Mitty as well, just joining. Sorry. Yeah, it doesn't matter to me the name. I, I don't care about it, to be fair. Uh, they're a competitor to me. Uh, and But then the, the, the question that they have to ask themselves when you're a player is that the person you want to be under, or is it Fabian Peng, you, who has a full, full-time full analyst on their side as well? I mean, you also saw the result and the, the step up that we took. We literally, in my mind, we, we choked out against D-plus in the league as well. We should have dominated them on, on that concert game. Um, we should have dominated them even harder in the playoffs. We didn't, and I think we played poorly. Um, yeah, so, so it's like, this is a team that people should be willing to be a part of like they everyone should want to be here and if they aren't then they're not the sort of person we would like anyways because then they're not willing to do anything that there is to win 
I like it. Fair enough. I like, I like the approach towards that. We'll come on to that more a little bit as well. I do want to ask about, or you kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier with the respect kind of like approach that a lot of Koreans take that you just like, you know, it feels a little bit weird to us as Europeans. What yeah. were the biggest sort of culture shocks that you had when you first went over there, met the players, or like, right, cool, let's sit down and start doing work? Were there any big things that you looked at and kind of had to take a bit of time to wrap your brain around? No, I mean, the, the thing is, I just make things my own way. I, I tell them constantly, this is not a team of, of um, yeah, this is not a Korean team. This is a team of Europeans with Korean players. Like, that's what it is. Hmm. And if they don't buy that, well, then we have a problem. Because that's what it is. And because of the respect, then they were like, yes, sir, understood, sir. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Which is their culture, right? But yeah, no, but but it, it, there's an understanding of like, we have to think for ourselves. We need to keep each other responsible. Like mm. they, they are the number one person to keep each other responsible. Because you get pissed when your teammates fuck up. And this is something everyone knows. But you kind of let it go if they say, hey, I fucked up. This rounds on me. I'll do better next time. You kind of let it go because it's just one of those things. Yeah, you, okay, we, they know they fucked up. So I don't have to be angry at them because they know they fucked up. They know they fucked us over and they learn from it. Mm. Which is the number one thing you want. Not someone's going to try and shirt blame or point fingers elsewhere. Yeah, yeah because you take the blame. You're like, you take the blame because you fucked up. It's that simple. Mm. Like, if you, if you own your mistakes, then nobody's going to be angry at you for committing them because. You know you made them. They know you made them. There are no surprises. Yeah, totally. I like it. And uh, step away from the players for a second as well, because you already mentioned uh, Donga Curley, the translator, former coach, yeah. uh, manager now. Uh, Dohun as well as the general manager, right? How have you found working with those two? Because obviously much more, I suppose, leaning towards the org side of things. It's not players here, it's more org side. How have you found that relationship? Uh, the org is doing more than what could be expected of any org. I mean, I think that mm. the org is, well, PSG Talon and Talon are two different things. Um, uh, PSG, well, yeah. it's basically a partnership between Talon and PSG, right? So that the games that PSG wants to be involved in for whatever reason, those are the ones that are called PSG Talon. Yeah. But they are supporting us in full. Like, the, the, there hasn't been anything that can be any questions? I mean, they sent us for our almost two week boot camp in, in Europe. Mm. Is, could there be any questions on how much they actually want to win? I don't think so, really, because very true. we wouldn't be like this if, if, if it was, right? Yeah, no, very, very true. I wanted to ask about PSG a little bit as well, because anyone who follows obviously football will know PSG as one of like the, the big global players. I think they were the first ever big international football club as well to invest in esports back in 2016 and get themselves involved in a few titles. Have you seen yeah. any kind of the any of the experience or the resources from that football side sort of bleed over in towards the siege side, or is it more of a look? We're here to put the money up. We're paying the players. We're paying you guys. You're kind of free to run this how you see best. Uh, I wouldn't know what sort of uh, economic or anything like this that they have as a deal. I have no idea. This is not my my side of things. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to basically what's happened, I mean, obviously they had to let go of Mbappe to pay me. Um, <laughs> so, so they, they chose Fabian over Mbappe and I mean, it's kind of understandable well, if you think about it. Yeah. I mean, once a three time world champion, once not, uh, whichever is which I, you're going to have to uh, tell yourself, but yeah, it's the, it, it's a choice they had to make. No, yeah, uh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, there's there's nothing that's like an overlap. I don't think, like, or at least not that I've noticed. Um, Fair enough. He's, the, he's pretty, uh, pretty clean. Really, in a way, you're kind of interfacing with Talon, who obviously then deal with PSG on that side for the partnership. Yeah, yeah, yeah makes sense. Cool. The, 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 it's, it's their job to do anything in between us. I am not involved in that at all. Makes total sense. Cool. I just I just talk about video games for a living. <laughs> I talk about video games to players and talk about it on a broadcast. The truly split life of Fabian. Um, yeah. Two months ago, so you picked up Joker as an analyst as well, right? Or was it yep. a, a month or two well, ago? Well, it was just before the major. We yeah. got him. Yeah. Um, I guess the first easy question is, like, why? And I, I think I already know the answer to this question, so it's kind of a loaded question, but why do you feel you need an analyst when you'd gone through the stage without one? Uh, because I'm not one. Uh, neither is Pengu. Uh, the, 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 the part that he has with us is not something that anyone can replicate. Like, I definitely can't. Because I'm 
let's put it simply. I'm, I'm someone who knows the game and I know how to build the right culture. The rest is not me. Mm. And all that analytical stuff is basically me having to... like. I did have some analytical stuff for this stage. I did. Uh, so don't get me wrong. Like I had all the map stuff that I needed that I would have used in any other team that I have used as a as a player and uh, when, when I was an in-game leader because obviously even as an in-game leader you want to have more information than as a normal guy just like a normal player so I had all of that stuff available to me but it's not my job to sit there every single practice uh, and uh, fill everything in it's just not me uh, yeah. I can't do it I can't be bothered to do it and if you want me to work as your coach then I will need someone who to do it for me mm. And again, slightly loaded question, because I think most who watch your style or have ever observed you at an event know what the answer to this question would be. But then if you think that's not you, what are you yeah. as a coach? You've mentioned the cultural lead. You've mentioned about knowing the game. The surely there's more depth to it than that, though. So give us a talk through that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of the, the entire thing, right? It's to provide the right culture for the team, because a lot of people, they don't provide the right culture for the teams currently. It, it, it's honestly that that is, I think, the biggest lack for esports that that coaches and the staff usually aren't good. Like they are kind of just people to sit there and I don't even know what they do. Like a lot of staff that I hear from other teams and from other players and from staff that I do trust is that a lot of staff is just pretty fucking useless. Which is really sad to hear, right? But mm. if some people tell me that I trust that, yeah, that person or that person is just not doing their job, well, then that's what I will trust. Especially if it's a person that I really, really believe in. And obviously, you you hear people all around, so it's just, yeah, you 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 hear a lot in the game, and you hear a lot in the scene. And I think I provide the right things, which is why I can do it and why I can basically get a team from where we, where PSG Talon were to where they were today and yeah. this major so it, it, it's honestly it's that simple provide the right place to be the right, provide the right, the right culture, culture. Yeah, it, I, I, I feel like my business like brain is bleeding into esports here and it's a really weird clash in my own mind but I've, I've asked this exact question to someone about a month ago in business define yeah. culture for me what does culture look like for you a good one versus a bad yeah. one so it's a, it's obviously a professionalism is the big one. Uh, are you a professional through and through? And this is where some players I've worked with in my life, both as players and as a coach, is basically their zero professionalism. Don't care about showing up on time. Don't care about the professional attitude towards work, like come to work and just run around having fun and laughing rather than actually taking it serious. Okay, you're in a five versus three. What do you do? Or, well, you're in a five versus two. Well, yeah, you have already won this round strategically. Because you've won it five versus two. But have you won the round yet? No, not really. Because five on two, you could lose. Do you go back to the site and you set up crossfires and you communicate and you play off each other because now you have the manpower advantage? No. Okay, well, then you're not the professional because you think that you will do that on match day. Yeah, you might do that on match day. You probably will do it on match day. And you probably will win. But what if you don't? But, but what if you don't? Yeah. And mm. this is like super reoccurring. Like, what if you never really take it properly? Well, then you fuck up, okay? You fucked up now. What does that lead to? Well, it might lead to you missing a major. It might lead to you missing main stage. It might lead to you not even doing anything. And that's where it's, it's, it's one of those things. It's like, you need to just keep pushing them to do the right things. Have the right culture within the team. How do you behave towards other people? How do you behave towards your teammates? How, how do you act as a professional? Do you do everything in your power to be the best professional out there? Or do you play games to four in the morning that are completely irrelevant to your career? Then you wake up five minutes before practice. Okay, I'll be honest. I wake up five minutes before practice, but that's because I start at 6 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> but when you work as a European player or a whatever player in your own region, but you start at two or three in the afternoon, did you wake up five minutes before your practice then? Not a chance in hell. You should have been up two or three hours before. You should have had lunch. You should have had gone out on a walk. I don't care if you sleep until 12 and your practice starts at three. That's up to you. But you should have gotten some fresh air. You should have prepared yourself. You should have warmed up mechanically. You should be there fully invested. 
to be bringing your best self to practice, right? Yeah, because you you practice like like you play officials like you practice. There should be absolutely zero difference between an official and a practice. And you should be just as pissed at yourself and as your teammates if you throw away a five on three situation because you didn't take it fully serious. Mm. I mean, I don't want to be like that, but look at G2's performance at this major. It's a fucking joke what they did. Those players, one of those players make more than the entire fucking roster I have in a month. And I can still make that team perform better? Sure. Would you put us in a best of three against G2 today? We probably would lose. We should lose. I mean, we should lose 95 times out of 100. But when your players don't want to and they don't care, then there's nothing that you can do to save them. Mm. Nothing. Because it all comes down to, are you willing to do these sacrifices? If not, well, then you should fuck off. Or at least that's how I run my teams. That everyone is there to work their ass off. I love how so far during the stream we've had now multiple, thank you, Benja, multiple, no cursing, uh, redeemed. And I guarantee you now, guys, it's not going to happen. I'm sorry. That's no, I'm going to curse as much as I want. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome to do so. Uh, so sorry, guys. Um... I want to dig a little deeper again, because I, I really like getting into the underbelly of what these things mean. So you said, really, for culture, it's about professionalism, how you act, how you communicate yeah. with others. The and how you treat is, people around you. Absolutely. And the other thing is, I think everyone has a slightly different perception on what professionalism really means. For some, yeah. it's turning up on time, it's being able to write in a very professional way that isn't the kind of way you talk to your friends. For others, it's your attitude towards certain things. Do you come yeah. in and say, right, here is my expectation for what professionalism means in this team, and here's how I expect you all to behave? Or do you hope that they're going to figure that out themselves and talk about it between them? Because some teams, no, these are, I, think these about are the rules. The, I think about the All Blacks, for example, right? But rugby team, as yeah. we all know, New Zealand, they have teamship rules and they have like five things they all agree. And if someone breaks that rule, that person gets called out straight away. Look, bro, you're breaking the rule. You're being a dick. Even if it's the head coach, you've broken the rule. Yeah. Not on. Don't make it happen again. How involved do you get with that kind of conversation? Well, that's where esports uh, is way different than uh, what... Um... Basically, we real life sports is. Um, I wish I had that power, but yeah. as the coach in esports, the hierarchy is a little bit upside down in most teams, uh, mm. especially European, North American, and and I would say Brazilian side. Um, the hierarchy is upside down. The coach usually comes underneath the players, um, and uh, that's obviously where it turns into a problem. I can present those rules as much as I'd like. If people don't want to follow them, um, I can punish them, sure, because the management will usually have your back, but that's not always the case. And therefore, well, sometimes you work for places and sometimes you don't. Mm. It's tough because I think about like football teams, right? And it, I think about this in a sense that this is this, quite close in in some ways and then very different in others. In, the, in a football team, uh, I can think of so many players that have played for Aston Villa that fit this bill. They'll just throw their dummies out the pram. They'll strop when they come on the pitch a little bit. They'll throw a fit when they get taken off a little bit too early than they liked or someone didn't pass them. And you see very aggressive or dismissive body language from them. You know full well the coach has got the ability to go, that's cool, I've got another 14 players behind me here that I can sub on at any time really and I'll take your spot. Yeah. Maybe not 14, but they have others available. In esports and especially in, in Siege, obviously, we don't have that easy ability to swap someone in because the team is so well gelled between these five players and how they work together. And no one wants to obviously be able to, well, haven't got the money for a start to be able to afford subs on these teams for each position. So it's hard to kind of say, meet this bar or you're being subbed out because they full well know, like you say, the power lies with them because they know they'd have to drop a player, bring someone in, teach them all of this stuff. And that is a very expensive, multi-month long process to get done. And so it does flip yeah. things upside down and it does make it difficult. How I mean, this obviously goes back more towards, I imagine, previous teams than it does so much the current one, given what you said about the career mentality towards respect. But how do you handle that? Because I guarantee you there are loads of coaches out there, or analysts who sit there thinking, I just wish this player would be more understanding, more considerate, they'd listen, they'd get on with everyone more. How do you approach that? It's such a hard question because it, it's such a sad state of affairs within Rainbow Six right now because of Tier 2 obviously being destroyed. Uh, so right now it's mostly who knows who, and uh, that's how you get players. Um, yeah. I, I think that, uh, for example, as well with what uh, Elegance have been done doing with the terms of uh, 
agency. Like it's great for the players because they actually get fair contracts, but it also turns into a really bad thing when he has a lot of players in his stable, which he then moves over to other teams. That that turns it into one of those things where it's like you kind of have to be buddy buddy with the right people to be able to get opportunities in Rainbow Six at the moment, mm. which is not great. Yeah. I don't think that he is particularly doing anything wrong because he is taking care of his players well, which is great. That's one, one thing we actually been missing because so many people have been fucked over in their contracts. But in the Rainbow Six right now, you can't really change people because people will just back each other with, with friendship. Um, that's one of those things where it's like, I just always will compare it to the gold old days. Yeah. It's impossible to be friends on a roster for, for, for that team. Like we couldn't be like, yeah, sure. We're friends now in, in, after everything has gone through, but were we friends when we worked with each other? Yeah. But that was secondary. Yeah. Everything else came first. If you fucked up during a major, if you broke the trust of the team, I didn't care that you were a really good friend of mine. You had to go. Mm. And yeah, it, it, it's such a hard time because I don't think that you can change players too much. They they will come to you with all that hunger and all that will to be good. And if they have that, then they will listen to me. But if they don't, you're kind of just stuck with them until you can change them. Mm. If you have the support of the organization to change them. If you yeah. don't, well, might as well change yourself. Totally. And uh, I know Fett's uh, stood into chat since we started this off as well. Like I said earlier on, he had a similar thing last week around this. It's like it's about that motivation, about that hunger, and how things yeah. build out from there 100%. And I have to ask the question about that big pivotal game, because many would look at your performances and say, you know, PSG played really well from the first game onwards. Yeah, absolutely. The one game that I think everyone is going to remember, of course, is that BDS game, right? And I want to get into that yeah. a little bit here too. How the fuck did that come to be? <laughs> yeah, beating a grand finalist team, one of the teams that everyone had favoured to win the whole thing as well, to come in and beat them, and dare I say, relatively comfortably so, was really, really exciting. How do you think you guys went about doing it, or how did you go about doing it, given you should know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we prepared like any other game. Um, I have done one thing with this Korean team that no other Korean team has done because they are like, oh yeah, we have these four maps, everyone bans them in Korea, so we've just been doing it too. And when I heard that, I was kind of mind blown because it's like, okay, so there are four maps that nobody in Korea plays. Wouldn't that be four of the maps we should be playing just so that every single ban phase we can win? Because we can decide exactly, okay, you don't play four maps, so you always ban those. Well, first of all, which one do you like the least? Those are the ones so you ban, ban in a best of three. We'll pick one of the other two. Mm. And then in best of ones, which one is your worst of the five remaining? All right, we'll play that one. So we can always steer you into the direction of this is the map we want. And that's what we're happy with. Oregon, of course, versus BDS. It's, uh, I mean, I think it's a pretty clear cut map for us. Uh, Oregon is super boring. Uh, it's super simple. You will always lose defense or attacks on basement, except they won the first attack and then we won one in overtime. Um, you should be losing basement attacks. I think, like, if I remember correctly from when I was with G2 and coached that team, like, win rate for basement defense was like 94%, 95% or something like this. It's crazy. Absurd. Yeah. Uh, top floor is kind of like a 65, 35 win rate. And then the off bomb side is like a 33% win rate. So you're always going to have a 4 2, which is why I took my time out when we were up 3 2. It looks super freaking weird. But I take my time off when we're up 3-2 and we just won a round? Well, it's because I knew that the importance of this game was in getting round number four on the board on defense rather than getting round maybe a timeout in attack when we're down 3-5. Yeah. So it was about telling them how to play the strat, which they misunderstood. Uh, we still won the round. Uh, I, I said to them, play the same clash strat as we did before, the one where we play mute in, in CCTV. But this time, don't play the Clash, and mute, you stay as long as you possibly can, because they are really shit at clearing you out. They're very slow, and they're not doing a lot of vertical. So what you do is, you stay in CCTV, and then you go for the roam, and you go for the retake, which Roy did, and then he killed the guy on the hatch, and, and we had 4-2 up on, on defense. Great. I know we're a decent attack team when we want to be, but we also reworked our entire attacks 
from our first game because obviously the good boys had a really shit time against bleed on Oregon. Uh, they played absolutely terrible attacks, not because that's what we particularly have in our practice routine, but more so that they were afraid. Mm. The first match, they they didn't have any speed. They didn't have any uh, ball, is the way we can put it. They just didn't have any balls, and therefore they, they, they didn't dare to make plays. And then against BDS, I said, nobody expects us to win. I mean, I said this for every game because it's honestly the truth. Nobody expects it's us true. to win. There's no yeah. pressure on us. Just go out there and have fun. Mm. It's so funny hearing you say that line as well, because again, it's something else that said last week was the number one thing that they always ask each other is, are you having fun? And even during that grand final, I think he said it was was Matt's so a hot and cold turn around. I was just like, are you having fun? Are you having fun? Are you having fun? That's all he wanted to know is, are you having fun? Because when you do that, you just play far better, right? And do you think the boys yeah. had fun? They kept that energy up throughout the tournament? Um, uh, after that BDS game, no. Uh, after the BDS game, they did not have fun anymore because <laughs> they put too much pressure on themselves. Um, expectations were too high. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be honest and say I think we I think I won every single map ban uh, of all the games we played. I think I probably I think heard I won the coach all. say maximum of three in my five years in siege, a max of three times as a coach said to me, I lost that map ban. <laughs> no one ever admits it when they lose a map ban, it's so strange. Um no, but uh let's see if I can actually I have the notes for it. I can give you which priorities we had for the map bans and, yeah, I'm and you can know. you can you can tell me if I'm right or not. Uh, if you pull up Liquipedia, so I would remember what maps we played. Map prep. Uh, okay, I have the ridiculous. Discord channel here. For Bleed at Manchester Major, uh, we played Oregon, right? Mm -hmm. Oregon was my number one priority for that game. Uh, BDS. Uh, if side choice, Oregon was number two order. Uh, map choice was a different map, but that was because I had something cooking uh but oregon was number one choice or sorry no, or number two choice for the bds game mm. so i got my number two map uh for face what map did we play face on where's the face game you played them on oregon cons oregon and consulate yeah consulate was our second priority map oregon was our sixth so obviously it's the best of three so what we want them to do is not pick our number seven Totally. Yeah. Uh, it was our number six, which means that we knew that they were going to pick either that or our number seven. And we were happy that we got Oregon. And then what was the third one? Uh, it would have been Labs if you got there. Yeah, so that would have been five. So that's like an even ban phase, right? Because I get to pick my second. I don't get my first, but that one I knew I wasn't going to get because they don't like that map. And that's how we had that. Against uh, Beast Coast, we played Border. That was our second priority map. And then I don't remember what else we played. We had uh, Oregon as our Sky, decider. Oregon. Skyscraper was our third priority map for mm. that game. I wasn't. I wanted Clubhouse, but they they banned it, unfortunately. They're, they're probably going to ban it. Yeah, I've got a curious a curious question about this. How much weighting do you put in this on your own team's preference versus the other team's preference when saying? Because for example, you said when the in the first two games Oregon was first and second, then in your next yeah. series it was sixth. Is that because you super heavily weight against what the other team prefers? I weigh it both ways. Yeah. And you find a balance in the it, middle. Yeah. So it, it's one of those things is you want to take your opponents to a map where they're uncomfortable, but mm -hmm. what you're also comfortable on. But then if they are also very, very comfortable on a map and we're fine with it, we shouldn't take them there. Yeah. So, it, so it's like I have to value it in terms of what is my priority in combination what is the opponent's priority. Mm. And then I'm... I'm happy if I get anything around it, really. But we have a much deeper map pool than people realize and what people think. And knowing that myself, and I don't mind telling people they can... I mean, maybe I'm lying. Maybe I'm not. But <laughs> we we, ha we have more depth than people realize. Yeah, fair enough. I like that. Um, this is kind of related because you also sort of touched on it earlier on as well around the prep between games. I asked that the same question last week. When you're coming into a competition, you win a game... You find out how yep. your opponent is. You've got less than 24 hours to prep for them. You can't sit there and really go through every single map they've ever played and analyze all the strats they use across those games in each of these sites in that amount of time that there simply isn't enough time. What do you prioritize when you have such little time to get ready for the team you've got the next day? I checked the last two games pretty much uh, on each map that I think that we're going to be on. And... Uh... 
if there's no information on one of the maps, well, you can't check it, so it shortens your workday. But you, you, you check two or three games, or you check the games against the good teams. Like, I'm not going to sit there and look at G2 versus Wild and then look at what, what G2 were doing against <laughs> Wild, because that's... Shots fired, I love it. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Right, I, I, I mean, I, I, I could win with both my hands tied behind my back against that team, or like me playing, so I, it wouldn't matter. <laughs> You don't watch those games because it doesn't matter. Uh, so, so you Fair. focus on what's important, yeah. and it, it's something that you get from just experience. Like you know what you need to focus on. Which teams did they actually play against, and which teams did they just brush aside? Sure. Uh, and then you you don't even look at into like hard counters because every team at this level is good enough to give you a small change to the entire strat. Like. I changed around all our attacks on on uh, Oregon for the BDS game from the beat game. Not a single one was the same. Mm. For Beast Coast Clubhouse, which was my number one priority, I made an entire new strat book for the entire map. I had new attacks, new defenses, all of it. Had they left it, I'm unfortunately not allowed to play that map because they banned it. But we didn't know. It was either going to be that or whatever other. I, I can't remember. We had a very clear match game plan against them. And had we gotten Border and Clubhouse, we would have been jumping and cheering and making backflips. Like, we would have been super happy. Mm. It doesn't always play out that way. But all the teams at this level are good enough to change things around. You cannot counter everything. And if you do, well, you fuck yourself over. Yeah. What do you think is the ideal number of strats or approaches for a given site to have? Like, some teams here have got five or six different strats that can line up. For some, it's two or three what do you think is the ideal number before it just becomes too much for players to have to remember? Uh, two strats is enough, and then you have adaptations on said strats. That's, that's the way you have to do it. You have yeah. to look at what it is that uh, your opponent is approaching. Take, take basement. Yeah, clubhouse. Super simple bomb site. You either roam or you turtle. All right. Well, you have one roam. You have one turtle. What do the enemy do? Check the VODs? Okay, they do something of this. Okay, but what do we need for that? Do they play grim? Okay, we need mute to avoid being seen. Well, are they constantly being Capitao? Well, okay, then we'll bring Womai. Maybe we'll even ban it. Uh, those are the small changes you need to have. Yeah. Um, kind of like how you then, touched on Oregon Basement earlier around the freezer hole, right? Have the Clash or not the Clash. It's still the same sort of setup. It's just one yeah. has a Clash supporting, one doesn't. Yeah, yeah. and what I wanted instead was to have a shotgun player to help him. So you have one shotgun on each side of the, that, that door. Just play aggressive. I said you can even play Jaeger shotgun. Mm. Like, Honestly, that shotgun is pretty good, so it wouldn't have meant, meant much. But honestly, you just play play something, and you have ADSs to defend yourself even harder. Yeah. Because I said they are not good at clearing the vertical. Yeah. Like it. Um, and to go deep into the layer, like how we were thinking about culture, went into professionalism, and then kind of the layer beyond that, how do you define what professionalism is? When you're talking yeah. about going back and watching these couple of maps before... What are you looking for? Are you looking for the ops they tend to play and how they use them? Is it something that's maybe outside the norm as to how they use them? Are you looking at maybe drone placements when they're on attack, certain little cute moments of team play they have? Does one player play further ahead than others? Like, What are the main things that you look for to identify, okay, this is how this team plays, the archetype we can put them into, and this is how we respond to it? Uh, it's basically the, the archetype, right? And then also it's the triggers. What is it that triggers different attacks and different defenses? Mm. If we go for it, again, we can go for for uh, Clubhouse. But say that we're playing a different bomb site. We're playing CCTV. Okay, if we attack from Master Bedroom or the opponent that we're watching playing against them or attacking from Master Bedroom, what are the triggers in their defenses? What is it that makes them lash out? Or what is it that they're playing around? What is their win condition when they're defending CCTV from a monster attack. Okay, can I bait that? Maybe. And if I play it twice, what is their fix for the problems they had previously? Okay, well, what if I go garage? So I'm looking like different things that I can force my opponent in, so that basically I'm it's kind, of like kind of forcing them into making an error and then abusing that error as much as we possibly can. Mm. I, I really like that as well. I guess, like you say, it's a case of identifying on a team by team basis where are the small variances yeah. that you can exploit and open up, which I like. Yeah. Okay. And taking a step back from that, then, what do you think of the format of the major? Because obviously, you've been through it now as a competitor with PSG Talon. Obviously, back with G2 last year, things have changed a bit since then with the whole blast coming in as well. What do you make of the sort of three phase format that we've currently got? I don't really care. 
say. Uh, I, I, I'm not. I'm not too bothered. Um, I, I, I think that five games. I, I like it that it's best of three to make it through, and I like it that it's best of three to go out. I think that's really, really good. Mm. Uh, I, I'm okay with phase two. I think phase two is really nice. Phase three, yeah. I mean, you can only play so much. Um, if you made it to phase three, maybe there should be a second, like a loser's bracket. But the problem is, I don't see, uh, I don't see what positive that would come from uh, because. There needs to be a perk for winning upper bracket, and that one map win that we had before is absolutely dog shit. Um, mm. Other than that, I, I I don't see what else you could give us a perk. Therefore, I don't see the idea of having a lower bracket because I see that there's no way to win it if that makes sense. Like you, you can't go out positive from it. Yeah, totally. It, that's always the debate: is what advantage do you give? And at one point, it was like you pick from one of three uh, map veto or map draft like selections. You choose how you want to kind of yeah. weight things in that way, rather than having the map win. But I like the single end that it is quite. You know, every game then really does actually mean yeah. shit ton. Like you don't win, you're going home, and that's it. I I think that uh, it, it it just it's better than it, it is it's with those like free win and the, the map choices that is put like I, I don't know if they have it the same still on online but it's like that you have the the choice to make that you even get given the choice to make a worse decision is absurd to me like there's only one way that you should take that like those three options that you had right one of them you get to pick the map without your opponent banning of course that's the one you should pick that's the only one that makes any logical sense. Because you can basically guarantee a win on that map. Exactly. Why yeah. are you even given the choice of the other map bans? Because they're dog shit in comparison. <laughs> why are you giving teams a choice or an option to make a mistake? Why, why, why are you doing that as an organizer? Like, just put them. This is the best pos possible one. There's no arguments about it. This is what you're getting. Hmm. No, I'm gonna pick the worst band rate. Or I'm gonna pick the worst band face just because I can. <laughs> just because I can. <laughs> yeah, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. A little kind of like side tangent to this one as well. Then, any teams that were there that surprised or disappointed you? One, I guess, positive. One, negative. Who overperformed against expectations? Who way underperformed? And I think I know who you might say for the second one, but we'll see. I mean, overperformed. Obviously, Beast Coast did like very, well, very much so. It is hard to argue that they didn't. Um, I mean, yeah, they won NAL, sure, but it's not the major, and it's not first place. Um, so I think that they should be very proud of what they managed to achieve, um, and obviously underachieved. I mean, there's only one team to even laugh at. Like, hey, it's, it's just pathetic that the that, that performance is pathetic. Losing to Firex with Nova, like, come on, yeah, the guy went negative in the Korean league for fuck's sake. Like, <laughs> negative in Korean league, you shouldn't beat G two. Yeah. Just, yeah uh, a meme, then the entire team uh, meme. Yeah, I think many of us would agree, and that was the team that I thought you were going to mention as well. Given the the memes about Firex over the years, to then have former world champions losing to them is a real fall from grace. Do you feel? Yeah. Given, I mean, obviously it's been a while since you've been with the team now as well, but I know you're probably in touch with a couple of the players still. Do you feel it was the right call for them to make the changes that they're looking to make? Uh, I'm not going to get any more than that. Fair enough. So you don't really know who's coming in yet as well, but obviously change is change. We'll see if it turns out to be the right one for them in the longer run. Yeah. Yeah. I wish them the best of luck. <laughs> I'm sure you do, just not when they're playing against PSG at international events. <laughs> yeah, very much. Um, and coming back onto the team for a second as well for PSG Talon, like, again, we know that you're looking to make a change at the moment, one or two, whatever that number might be. The one concern I think everyone would fairly raise about Korea, and you may reflect on the same, is talent pool. You know, how many incredible players are there out there that are really going to set the sky on fire? People will probably say not all that many. You know, I look back to when, for example, Good Boy came through and Firex obviously picked him up. Sure, he's had a few good games, but hasn't quite been the generational talent that many would hope would take Korea to a new level. How do you feel about that when looking at things for Korea? Are you considering players from outside of Korea? Must they be Korean or at the very least speak Korean? What's your view on it? Yeah, they, I mean, they, they need to speak Korean. Otherwise, it's going to be hard with the Korean players, seeing as they speak very limited English. Yeah. Uh, but right now, that's the, the only way we're aiming to go. Um, but yeah, the Korean talent pool is um, very shallow. 
you couldn't drown in it, that's for sure, even if you passed out with your face in it. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, there's not that much to choose from. Um, and we'll, we'll see where that leads us. No idea right now what's going to happen, but we'll figure it out eventually. Again, right. it's it's one of the teams that everyone should want to join us. Why wouldn't they? Like, If, if you don't want to join PSG Talent at this moment and you're playing in Korea, you're just a silly boy. You're not a good boy, you're a silly boy. <laughs> And I hope or, not, not, maybe much. maybe you'll be crazy boy though, right? No, no, I hope God for everything in this world that you're not crazy boy because if you put up those numbers, you probably shouldn't be playing anymore. <laughs> Poor crazy boy, man, he's been pulled in here and literally lit up in front of a firing squad. Bless his soul, brother. <laughs> he can go play Roblox for all I care. <laughs> Bless him. So, what comes next for you guys now? Obviously, at some point back in towards practice, things like esports World Cup are coming up as well. You mentioned that you've had a break after the major. When are you guys back at it? And I'm really curious about what kind of your practice schedule looks like as well. What sort of thing you put in place as a coach? Uh, I mean, we have to go 100% for EWZ, right? So we have already put in a double practice schedule. We started uh, three days ago. And we're going to be working uh, double practice five or six days a week. And uh, the one day we can't find that, we'll work one practice. But also on top of that... It's theory sessions and VOD reviews. Um, internal VOD reviewing is very, very important. And it's something that I couldn't get G2 players to do um, for whatever reason. But I can get the Koreans to do it. And that basically is them looking at their own VOD in the five-man POV. So we see all of what's happening. Uh, and therefore, learn from their own mistakes. Point out their own mistakes. And if someone didn't own them up during the practice, well... They have no other choice but tone them up now because everyone can literally see the mistakes you're making. Mm. And, and and again, it's, it's it's me putting a lot of responsibility onto the players. Yeah. Just because I genuinely believe that all good things comes from within the team. Like you need to have that work ethic that you put in the hours to do this. Because when you go onto the server on an official, nobody's there to save you but yourself. Mm. I love how Fetch just popped in. I saw Fabian looking for triple scrims during our boot camp, and I knew they were going to do well. Triple scrims. Yeah, yeah I mean, there's nobody who's going to tell us that we didn't work the hardest. Mm. The simple as that. Because if we work the hardest, then we only got ourselves to blame. If we're not good enough, that's fine. I'm okay with not being good enough at this point. We're not supposed to be. But we can definitely be the hardest working team. We were literally the team that, okay, uh, another, we see that another pro team had no practice this time, and they're looking for one right now. Okay, we'll squeeze in two maps. We'll add another two maps, and we kept doing that. Okay, G two uh, don't have a practice right now. Okay, we'll play you guys right now, immediately. Just load up on the server. If that's one map, it is one map. And yeah, it, it's just we work the hardest. Simple as that. Mm. Have any of the players ever complained about how hard you work them? Yeah, <laughs> they yes. can try. Uh, <laughs> no, they actually haven't. Not the Koreans. Um, the learned, Koreans would never do to translate it. "cry me a fucking river" into Korean, so you can say it's no, the plane. No, I, I just say "shibar," and they understand what "shibar" means. I have no clue. It's it's something about the dog, I think. But Maddox, no idea. Maddox, please translate. I know we're going to Maddox in the chat, and he'll be able to tell us exactly what it means. <laughs> but that basically just goes, "I don't care. We're doing it right." Yes and no. I care to the extent that okay, you're not happy with it. Well, okay, then you probably shouldn't be here. Mm. Because there is only one goal here. And that is to win. Hmm. I look back at, say, yeah, I, I always find really interesting how teams approach this. I think back to, for example, uh, Rogue, obviously, at Berlin. It's the one example everyone pulls back to. And I've heard from a couple of coaches that other teams have done this where they don't have a hyper-intense schedule at events because you just don't have time to scrim whilst also playing every day, if not every other day as well. Yeah, it's it's the it's the playing period, the boot camps that tend to be really really intense. Uh, yeah. How how did you approach mentality for the players when they weren't playing? Was it a right? We're going to vod review. We're going to chill out for the night. We're going to get a good night's rest. We'll wake up tomorrow. We'll warm up and then we're straight into a game. What was your what was your approach to that throughout the event? Because it, no, it, it, it can be a bit of a slog. 
So I don't believe in in uh, the idea of practicing too hard during the event. Because if you're not ready at the event, it doesn't matter. Um, what you have to do is very simple work. And it's the coach and the staff that together, this is the map that we're going to be playing. And mm. you choose from those those maps. Obviously, you have a conversation with the team as well. Are they happy with these? Whatever. And then from that, the coaches and the analysts the night before, they will be watching through VODs. Then they will be presenting the team with these are the maps we are most likely to play. I would like you to watch the last game where maybe last one and a half, depending on which rounds we find interesting. Then I make the team sit down and watch one map for an hour, 15 minute break, one match for an hour, 15 minutes break, and keep repeating that until we watch four or five maps, depending on what, how much we need to do. Mm. Usually ends around four because I, there are some maps that I don't really care about how the opponent plays. I know we're better than them, so we should be just playing it. And we should just be playing our game. If I want us to play our game, I don't let them watch the VODs at all. If I want us to look at what they're doing and have in our mind small counters, that is all on the players. I cannot come to them and say, hey, these are the small counters you should be doing. This is the reasons for it. I can tell you all about it. But you still haven't seen it yourself. Hmm. You need to see it yourself. If you see things on your own, you're all set. Because then you remember these things. Okay, they're opening the barricade on this window. Well, that could actually mean that they're triggering the pressure here, but they're not coming here at all because we saw in the vault that they did that three times in a row. They opened that window and then they fucked off. They opened that door barricade and then they fucked off. But if they open this part of the map, then we know what they're doing. Got it. So I can know step two while they are support performing step one. And the yeah. players see that much better if they watch it themselves. Yeah, totally. And I love that as well, because the number of times that we do, you know, we speak about it on cast a lot, right? This phantom pressure that teams create by opening up a window or a barricade, or even just the tiniest bit is enough to strike the fear of God into some players, knowing that they have to be really careful playing around a certain part of the map. But as you say, reading into it feels like a really smart way to say, right, it's bait, don't worry about it. Until, of course, it's not bait, and they just think, okay, last three times we've done this, we haven't played that window, now we're going to play that window, just to really fuck Fabian up, right? <laughs> and I bet that happens sometimes, Maybe. right? How often do you go yeah. into it where you've analysed something and designed what you believe to be a counter to it for a team to then do something completely different? Just because you know that they are... Um, just because you know they're doing something and they might be just pressure, phantom pressure, doesn't mean that it's always going to be. Um, I have started teaching the boys when I came here that... The way that the gameplay is currently played is by finding gaps and finding opportunities. It's not the old style of an entry fragger who just runs straight into the gun fights and guns blazing and take a straight on fight. Yeah. Um, it's very different from that. And because it's different than that, what happens is you need to be aware of your own gaps. Okay. They are fake pressuring here. Well, yeah, it's still a gap that we need to be aware of. Doesn't mean that it might be used, but we need to know that the gap exists so that we pay attention to that area or that space and we don't let that surprise the rest of us. Because as soon as we get surprised by an opponent's play, we fucked up. Mm. Should never be surprised, ever. It means you misplayed or miss communicated or misread mm. when it comes to reading these gaps and finding them in gameplay really dig into the depths of a round here if you're looking into a round and saying okay there's a gap here and a team can be very mobile it's very rare that all five players plant their feet and never move unless they're turtling on oregon yeah. basement late into the round or something right how do you how do you have the players able to one recognize that there is a gap that exists two communicate it quick enough and then three formulate a plan and act on that plan before the gap disappears. Because those things can happen in the space of, what, five seconds? And you have yeah. to be ready for it. But then that's where the, the way of the meta comes in, that it's not about the team exploiting those gaps. It's um, you as an individual have to do it, and then the team has to rally around it. So you need to have five players who are all able to exploit the gap, because if you only have four players, or if you only have three players that are available to do this, and like have depth of understanding of the game, or maybe just the balls to do it, then... There will be gaps that constantly never get used, and therefore, the players that can use the gaps, they'll be fucked because they will have to try to like make their own gaps, 
which comes down into gunfights, but we all know how many gadgets there are in defense. So uh, you jump in a window, okay, lesion trap, then remind, um, okay, I'm about to die. So yeah, there's just too many things that are going on right now in the game. Um, you need to have all five players willing to go in and just go nuts. Yeah, which well, strikes a really interesting point here because obviously we've seen BDS kind of the breed A and then the other four. Like you could sit there and wage, okay, they've still got an entry and a second entry, but you look at the numbers, a lot of them get involved in those engagements, right? It's that flexibility across the team that means realistically any of those four players could get pulled into a gunfight at any time for that entry to start the round off. Do you yeah. think that that's the kind of new way that Siege has gone? Because I look back at when TSM won SI a few years ago, it was very classic to have two backline players and then a trio up front, similar to how Eminem played in EU for a while as well. Are we now in a time where there's like one support, maybe IGL in the backline, and then four players all being more flexible up front? I mean, I think even that the hard flex support, whatever you want to call it, like because I see it as five flex players, one guy has to play hard breach, but there are hard breach gadgets now, so you can just play that if you need it. I mean, As for Basement see, yeah. Oregon, for example, you can just play two guys with hard breach gadgets, play Ying and Grim, and you have the gadgets for later as well. So mm. you don't even need a hard breach for per se, but you still have one guy that's more like the flex support, and then you have four flex entries, and they all have to take the gaps if they find them. Uh, and you cannot doubt yourself, because if you doubt yourself, you'll screw your rest of your team over. Do you think that's a sign of the meta that we're currently in? Do you think that will change in future? Maybe. I don't know. It, 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 this is what it is right now. And back in the days, it used to be what Virtus Pro plays today, uh, which is clear all from one side. And then the 3-2 was for a while as well, but that's kind of the same as I would say pushing from one side. Just now, it's a lot about finding gaps and using them or creating them and putting pressure. A lot of this can be done on basically a whiteboard with like the, the map above, above. Okay, these are the default position for the defenders. Where are the gaps for the attackers? All right, you spot a defender somewhere else. Well, that means that the gap is somewhere else. If a defender is in a gap spot that you expect it to be open, well, that means that another spot is not being held. So that's where you should enter and find your way in. Got it. Cool. I think I've gone through all the things that I had listed down to talk to you about, which is quite wonderful. Is there any, any kind of final things that you want to go through or share on your side, things that you think would be interesting to know about, whether it's yourself or PSG? No, nothing from, from my side. I didn't even prepare that stuff. I just showed up, did what I was supposed to do, and then <laughs> uh, I'm, a, I'm a simple man, like my potatoes, and I eat my meat, and that's it. <laughs> I guess I have a question about the future, actually, before we do look to wrap things up. Uh, how, yeah. how long do you think you keep doing this for? And what the, is this for? Uh, are we talking coaching? Are we talking uh, esports? Uh, are we let, talking? Let, 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 let's say coaching. You're bouncing and out of like talent coach, talent coach, that kind of thing, right around that space for for a little bit of time now. Um, in fact, this would be a thing. That obviously, I would naturally have a answer in my own mind, but others might not as well. Uh, how do you find the difference between being a coach and being a talent member? Because obviously, you're doing both at the moment as well. Uh, running the two must be quite strange side by side. I mean, I wouldn't be coaching if being a talent paid enough and I got enough work um, oh, is man. the way I can put it. <laughs> um, but at the same time, that doesn't mean that I put coaching on, on backburn. Like That is currently the, the main priority for me, even though talent work is very enjoyable and you work very little for the money you get. But it doesn't pay enough to keep everything on, you know, like it doesn't mm. pay enough because it's a company. And then I have to tax half of that money away if, because of Swedish taxes. Um, so so it, it, we'll see how long it goes. I mean, some people would say going to Korea is a retirement home. Yeah, I agree with you, but it's not the retirement home that you think it is. It's not that I'm just sitting here doing nothing. I am here to actually make the region good. And this is, this is the product I wanted to have because here people give a shit about what I say and people respect me and care about what I have as opinions. Mm. That's not always been the case, which is, well, other reasons, and we don't need to get deeper into that. But that's why I went here, because here there is a project that actually believe in the idea that I present and they follow through on it. And I mean, you can clearly see why things are going correctly. It's, it, it's such a weird thing to, to even have to tell people and like explain to people but i've won those things for a reason i've won everything i've won for a reason that doesn't just happen so maybe put some trust in the person who has won everything and then then maybe you'll see more success 
Or maybe you'll just win an SI again and then never see any more success because nah, I'm not going to get into that. But... <laughs> we definitely could, but we shan't. Uh, one of the we shan't. Re- one of the questions re- related to that as well. I've seen a lot of players tweeting about this over the last couple of weeks about how shit EU scrim culture is right now. Do you think, again, that's the real kind of poison that sits at the very bottom of the EU well right now where there is that problem of people not taking it seriously enough and it's part of why you've gone over to Korea, but do you think there's that attitude problem that we have here in the West towards Siege and esports in general? No, it's not the it's not the 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 culture in general. Uh, the rotten structure comes from the top, starts at the top. Mm. Because if the teams at the top wouldn't allow themselves to practice the teams that have bad scrim culture, those bad scrim cultures wouldn't exist. Because everyone wants to scrim the G two, the BDSs, and then and the Wolves and the Virtus Pros. Everyone wants to practice them. They are the ones allowing it to happen. And why is it allowed to happen? Because they probably have it themselves. Mm. And I mean, I have the experience from G2. Yeah, that team has a rotten practice culture. I tried to change it. They didn't want it changed. And the, the reason why the entire region becomes rotten because of these things is because the people in charge of it and the people at the top, they don't take it seriously enough. Therefore, the rest just falls apart underneath it. Mm. Because if you were a team that didn't take it seriously, but you're a tier 3 team, do you think that any one of the serious tier 1 teams would practice you? No, they wouldn't. It's a waste of time. Mm. So It's from the top. It's not from the bottom. I remember actually, I want to say it was... I don't want to kind of like say outright that I think it was Helby that said this. I think it was him, so but I wouldn't put my name on it because I'm not 100% sure I put my house on it, I suppose I should say, because I'm putting my name to it by saying it. I'm pretty sure Helby said the problem is if you blacklist everyone that has bad screen culture, doesn't turn up on time, things like that, you're left with no one to scrim. But do you think it's probably more of a sign of things that have just been around for so long now that it's hard to change those ways or get them to improve and it's just a, it sort of is what it is until we make drastic change across the whole group or across the whole region. What's your view on that? I mean, it's corruption that's been coming through the entire game. That's the way it simple is. Like, uh, the people that had that culture and that work ethic, they have been replaced over time with people who I would say are better friends. Sure, they might be better mechanical players as well, but a lot of the leadership and the the people keeping the the, the actual culture within teams have just been replaced because people don't want that work effort. They don't care for it, and they, they think that it's an easy job that they can just relax on, get paid well, and then do whatever they want on the side. Yeah. Don't have that appetite or that hunger that we were speaking about earlier. Yeah. They just want to sit there, relax, and play those... Well, some teams only practice three maps a day. They want to play those three maps and then fuck off and play whatever else. Mm. And they get paid shit tons to play three maps a day. Impressive. <laughs> yep. Crazy. Awesome. Well, as a final check and a final last again, looking back at that future, then we'll look to wrap things up. You said earlier on the goal is top four at SI next year. Is that what we're going to hold uh, on to here and have a conversation about? Not at SI, at the majors. This, this SI is still considered this year for us. Like oh, okay, this, so this you're doing the, the siege year rather than the calendar year. Uh, yeah, exactly. Okay, so we should look out for May 25 is when we expect to see a top five, uh, sorry, top four for you and the boys. That's when we will be aiming for it. If we don't make top five, we make top eight, we'll also be happy. I mean, we have to look at it from the perspective of where is Korea right now in the global scene, but also where is Korea from ever before. I mean, the only reason Korea even has a top four finish is because two Korean teams played each other. Mm. So it's not like it was an impressive run by D+. It's also COVID, so there was no crowd. Where's the pressure? There yeah. isn't one. All of I think in that case is they did have they were one round away from being grand finalists, which yeah, is, well, a single okay. can be one. That's even worse. It's horrible. Yeah, I mean I'm one gunfight away from being an eight-time world champion as well. You never know how the butterfly <laughs> would fall or make make a movement, right? Yeah, it, it, it's, I don't give a shit. You could be a one round. You can be a hundred. It doesn't matter. You're not there. Yeah, I feel it. I feel it. Well, Fabi, I've all out of questions to ask you. Anything else you want to add before we wrap up? Uh, buy the PSG Talon skin. Thank you. <laughs> That's always going to be the easy one. But no, it's been a really yeah. good chat, mate. Really appreciate it. And um, maybe we'll do this again early next year when we're at that point where you feel you guys have really got to a stage you're happy with. But no, big thank you for the chat. 
Maybe I've just disappeared into the shadows. Who knows? Maybe I've retired at that point. <laughs> Maybe you will be. We'll find out. We'll find out. But until next time, guys, yep. hope you've all enjoyed the episode and catch you again soon.